Rushing Wind Biker Church at 10 Peach Tree Court in Holbrook, New York, the crossroads of freedom and faith. God bless you all. Jesus loves you all. So I want to welcome those that are here that are visiting. Uh, apparently I should uh, announce a, a message I'm giving more often. Uh, of course, after today, I'm not sure you all agree with that. But I'm going to ask us all to stand and come to the Lord in prayer. We have a holy God, amen? amen. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of us standing in his, uh, in his presence. So let's pray. Father God in heaven, Lord, we're, we're coming to a, a new year. Lord, we have so many years behind us, so much wasted time, so much wasted energy, so many plans that ended up going nowhere, producing nothing for the kingdom. Uh, Lord, tonight we want to have you break us. Lord, break us before it's too late. Lord, we have an opportunity Right now, in two and a half days, we get a new start with a new year, a new decade. Lord, let us have a new purpose. Let us have a new focus. Lord, I pray everyone in this place allows the Holy Spirit to have their way in their soul, in their spirit, to do the hard work that needs to be done. Lord, that they can have victory Lord, it's not about us just honoring and worshiping you for the sake of honoring and worshiping you. You're our loving Father, and you cry because we don't have the victory, and we don't have the joy, and we don't have the purpose, and we don't step into the things that you've, you've placed so readily available for us. Tonight, let us understand that, and let us pick up our big boy pants and walk this walk of faith. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. So uh, I just want to give a couple announcements because Jerry, uh, Jerry had to work late, so she's not here. First thing I want to do is our mission statement, for those who know it. You know our mission statement? Yes. It's in the bulletin. I have become all things to all men, so that I, by all means, may save some. That's the Russian wind mission statement, that whoever walks in those doors, they're as welcome as anyone else in this place. Whether they have leather, whether they have piercings, whether they have dresses and suits and ties, it means nothing because we're one kingdom. Amen? Amen. And so, this message today has been on my heart for a long time because um, sometimes you get tired of not seeing God victorious in lives. You know, you preach and you share and you teach and you counsel and you see the same people going through the same things year after year after year. And in two and a half days, actually two days and five hours and 17 minutes, we get to enter a new year. We're in an important uh, place right now between Christmas and New Year, a place where we can reflect because we've just come off the greatest celebration of uh, a gift given by God that we might have an extraordinary life. And we're at uh, the precipice of a new year. You know, thank God for new things. Amen? Amen. Thank God that we can put the things behind us and move into the future that he has for us. And I hope tonight you can get an understanding of that. Because we, we have a scripture, and I'll bring a little bit of it later, where Jeremiah says, I, I have a, a promise for you and a purpose for you and a plan for you, a plan to give you a, a future and a hope. And the thing is, we don't understand that most people have no future. Some of you here do not have a future. Because in order to have a future, you need to not carry the past. Most of us carry the past around. And so we're walking in the remnant of the past with the burdens of the past, and it keeps us from our future. And tonight I pray that through this very hard and challenging message, 
We can let the past drop to the ground. Even the past we like. Even the past that is part of the joy of the world that we've had. Because the joy of the Lord needs to be what's important. Amen? Amen. Not the desires of the flesh and the desires of what the world says is a good life. But what God says is the best life and the best desires. You know, we enter this time of year and uh, it affects people differently. You have some people that um, this time of year and coming into a new year and Christmas is like a deep cleansing breath. When you take a deep breath in and you can exhale all the stuff of the past. And then breathe in newness of next year. So some people, this is an exciting time of year of refreshing, of bearing the past. And other people, they come to this time of year, and, and because kind of life stands still, once you get past the shopping, because life doesn't stand still while they're still shopping, they do, amen? And, and sometimes people go through their year, and the busyness keeps them from the place of darkness and despair. And some people feel loss this time of year because it's accentuated. Because it's a time of year that was a time of celebration of family and friends and, 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 and just love and sharing. And sometimes people, uh, they don't want to reflect. Reflecting today can be a, a challenge to some people. And um, it can be a great time of year, but it can also be a dark time of year. As sad as that, that sounds. Some people reflect on the good year they've had. And some people look back and want to bury that year very deep because it was a challenging and hard year. Uh, we've had both in our church. We've had some people that have had some really hard, hard years. Years of loss and financial challenges and, and employment and relationships and all kinds of chaos. And uh, we want to look forward for those people. And some people are coming off a year that might be a good year. And it's not a bad thing to look back and reflect and be thankful and have gratitude on how good the Lord has been in the past year. But don't rest on it. Because in two, uh, two days and five hours, a new year starts. Sometimes you look forward with an excitement of a, an anticipation of a, a great future or something different. And sometimes you look forward and there is despair and uncertainty and fear when you wake up in a new year because there are things that are just uncertain and you're not sure exactly what tomorrow will hold. And so this is a critical time for all of us, no matter where you stand on that that spectrum. But one thing is for sure, in two days, five hours, and now 13 minutes, there'll be a crystal ball in Times Square that will slowly bring an end to 2019 and usher in a new year and a new start. But don't forget this. By the time you're done hugging and kissing your family and friends, You've already wasted some of next year. It's already gone. Time stands still for no one. And we need to understand that. So we have a church and even people that have come here that are visiting, we're not in our teens no more. Amen? Um, we have a lot of experience in this church. And the people that come here, even to visit, have a lot of life to bring to the table. And that's a good thing. But it's also uh, saying to us, we're in a place where there's no more time to waste. Amen? Amen. We don't have a minute left to waste. You know, um, God is here tonight. I hope you realize that. The praise was powerful. You know, Jesus is here. Amen? Amen. 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 I hope you understand Jesus is here. And the Holy Spirit is here. And the question that God is going to ask you tonight is, are you here? Or are you in what work tomorrow is going to hold? Or are you 
in a place waiting for the mailman tomorrow? Or are you wondering if you're going to sleep good tonight? Because you need to put all that aside. Because God is here, and you need to be here. All of you. Not falling asleep. Not letting your mind drift. Because God is here, but never doubt that Satan is lurking. And this isn't his domain. But he does have a powerful force in the world. And some of us carry it around even when we're in church. And we'll find our mind going to different places. And you might just miss what I'm going to talk about tonight. Maybe the most important message of 2020. I pray that's what many of you find here tonight. Because life's not getting any shorter, amen? amen. Anybody here feel life's getting, you know, like longer? It just seems like we wake up and there's a lot less in front of us than there was behind us. Amen? Amen. So we got to stop wasting time. This is the message God put on my heart today, this week. It's going to be hard. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to convict you. I'm probably going to offend some of you today. Because God needs to offend people today. So that you have victory tomorrow. Because I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm here to help you have victory. And God is here and the Holy Spirit wants to, wants to pour victory into your life. And not nice fancy stuff to make you feel all fuzzy and warm. Right? We got an eternity to feel all fuzzy and warm. You know? And how we step into that eternity, the power and what we get to hand our Savior is going to be determined by how you step into this life. And not expect fuzzy and warm, but expect challenges and attacks, because only through that is true joy, true peace, and true purpose found. And that's probably the nicest part of what I'm going to say tonight. Uh, Psalm 39, verse 5, says, Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths, my lifetime is as nothing before you. I think Angela said that earlier. It's just, you're here and you're gone. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath and we're gone. Time is short. Time is fleeting. People are going to hell. People are going to hell. And we are the hope of the world. Amen. Never forget that. You know, when I was going through this message, songs go through my mind. Sometimes television shows, if you know me, sometimes it's television shows, sometimes it's things in a movie. But there's lyrics to a song some of you might know called Time. Some of you might know who it is, is by. Some of you is not. If people know me, they probably know who it's by. But the lyrics of this song really brings to the forefront the reality of our life. It's just ticking away the moments that make up a dull day. You fritter and waste the hours in an offhand way, kicking around on a piece of ground in your hometown, waiting for someone or something to show you the way. Tired of lying in the sunshine, staying home to watch the rain, you're young and life is short and there's time to kill today. But then one day, you find 10 years have got behind you. No one told you when to run. You missed the starting gun. So you run and you run to catch up with the sun, but it's, it's sinking. Circling again to come up behind you again. And the sun is the same in a relative way, but you're older. Shorter breath and one day closer to death. Every year is getting shorter. I never seem to find the time. Plans that either come to naught or half a page of scribbled lines. There's a writer in here. You kind of understand what that means. Things left unsaid and undone. Hanging on in quiet desperation. That's the English way. The time is gone. The song is over. I thought I had something more to say. 
It says a lot about life. What does your life say? What has your life said? Most people go through life without Jesus. They go through life and they, they live their lives and the best they can have is some minor temporary meaning or purpose that just die with them and goes to the grave when all is said and done. It's like they're chasing windmills, thinking they're slaying dragons, if you know the Don Quixote story. They delude themselves that they have a purpose when they're really doing nothing but chasing the wind. Ah, oh, but if you follow Jesus, if you follow Jesus, amen? amen? It's a whole different story. You know, uh, what does your life say to the world up to this point in your life? What has your life said to the world for Jesus Christ? If you stop breathing right now, what has your life said to the world? about Jesus Christ. You ever think about that? Yes. Right now, the book's closed. What legacy are you leaving for the one who shed his blood and took the nails and the scars? What do you have to show for it? A more profound question, tomorrow if you're standing before Jesus, does he know you? Does he know you? What does he know of you? Does he know much about you? Because if you think you said a prayer and Jesus knows you, uh, you may be mistaken. Because Jesus only knows those who, who make, them, make him their Lord. It's not a prayer that's like a fire escape to escape the flames. It's a surrender of a life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Just think about it, the clock stops tonight. Tomorrow you stand before Jesus. He will either be your king or he will be your judge. And even if he is your king, there are things he's going to judge. It's the reality we live in. You know, it's important that every one of us reflect in the next two days and five hours and decide what we're going to do. What are we going to do come Tuesday night at midnight? Look back at all the years behind you and see what have you done with those? How much has been wasted? I've wasted a lot of years and so I strive not to waste one more second. And I pray that, that some of you are convicted and even offended today to the point where you refuse to allow Satan to waste another second of your life. Allow the world to con you and deceive you into thinking that there's purpose, that there's joy, that there's fun. And all it does, it's robbing you of every second of real purpose and real joy and real peace because you will never find peace. What have all the years behind you amounted to? Has anything drastically changed in the last year? You, you, you sat in a place and stood in a place, December 31st, 2018, waiting for a ball to drop. And we all had resolutions, promises, wishes, and hopes. And how many of you find yourself in the same place wishing for the same thing? Another year older and closer to death. That's the reality of it. Some people waste, wasted 2019 for Jesus Christ and have accomplished nothing. And it has to stop. Amen? Amen. And the only way it can stop is if each one of us looks at ourselves. We can't go around complaining about everyone else. You can't complain about the person across the aisle behind you in the next seat. Because we have to do this ourselves individually. Then corporately, Christ can move. And the Holy Spirit can make changes.
but we need to look at ourselves. You know, have I had a decent year? I don't know. All I know is I could have done more. I could have been more. I could have helped more. I could have affected more. And so I want to step into this year with a new anticipation of every second. Is Jesus more your Lord today than he was a year ago? Is he more your Lord today than he was a year ago? Or have you faded? Or have you cruised? Because right? there is no cruising in Christ. If you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. Another year older and closer to death. I'm going to be repeating a lot of lines from that song. Because we need to hear God speak to our soul. Because souls depend on it. I dare say possibly some of your souls may depend on it. I never assume everyone that sits in church has totally surrendered to Christ. I would be a fool to do that. And I will never presume, because I owe it to my Savior not to presume, just in case someone has been misled and hasn't accepted the reality and stepped into the true faith in Jesus Christ. My prayer while putting this message together is the title becomes a reality. I pray that some of you today, this becomes the most important message of 2020. No matter what you hear from now until the end of 2020, I pray some of you are wrecked by God tonight. That this resonates as a starting point where we're not going to play games with the gospel anymore. We're going to take Jesus seriously because he seriously took a cross for us. And he took us seriously when he took that beating and he took those nails. I wish someone would have prayed, would have gave this message 30 years ago to me. And then I think back and I think maybe somebody did. And I was there and not there. Ever been in church and been there but not there? Can we all admit to that? Because my, the world just has us. And you don't even know what you missed. So I dare say that I've heard messages like this through my life, but I was there and I wasn't there. You know, the sad reality, and this is going to be a very honest message, is that some of you, possibly most of you, are going to walk out of here tonight. And then two and a half days are going to go by, and a ball's going to fall, and you're going to be in exactly the same place you were yesterday. And these are going to be wasted words. I pray not, because I know how many years I wasted not listening when a powerful preacher said some words that probably could have got through, and the Holy Spirit was just ramming me, and I'd have nothing of it. You know, uh, I don't want to find you a year from now with the same expectations. I want to find you a year from now with, with uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Horizons. With realized expectations. Because once you have realized expectations, you have higher expectations. See, this could be the greatest year of your life till next year. That's my prayer. Amen. Because this year, no matter how great it is, does nothing for the next year. But it can be a springboard, and it can get you into the next year. And I pray the next couple of days you think, and you meditate, and you get close to the Lord, and you listen to the Holy Spirit convicting you, and you look at your life, and you look at how you spend your time, and you look at the friends you have, the places you go, and what you do. And the Lord convicts you. Because you're the one missing out. When you're out doing the things that the world says is fun, you have no clue what fun is. You have no freaking clue. You know, when you, when you really have given your all to Christ and you are where he wants you to be, whether it's in church, or whether it's sharing with someone, or whether it's not with the people that you're normally with, 
you will be astounded at the joy and the peace and the life that builds up in you. Because the enemy tries to con you that you're losing out. What a lie. Amen. But he's good, isn't he? He keeps us in lockdown. You know, and, and the reason I, this is an important time is because we're people that need a moment to decide. Are we? It's like we plan, so I'm going to quit smoking. And five o'clock next Thursday. <laughs> I'm going to quit smoking. And we, we prepare and we get ready. And at 7 o'clock, we buy another pack of cigarettes. <laughs> that was my story, just so you know. But we have something in us that wants to prepare and, and get ready. And, and that's why this is an important time between Christmas and New Year's. We have two hours, two days, and four hours and 55 minutes. Time waits for no one. This message will be counted down to you. Because if you walk out of here the same, I want you to know how much time you wasted. I want you to build up the resistance. Because once you leave here, everything's going to tell you, I got to do this tomorrow, I got to go to work tomorrow, I got to get involved in this, and I got this dinner engagement, I have this and I have that. And all of a sudden, this is going to be a distant memory, if it's a memory of all. No one told you when to run. You missed the starting gun. My prayer is I can shout to you the starting gun. I want to pull the trigger that resonates in your life the moment that you decide that you're going to run the race that Paul talks about. We've missed the starting gun too many times, amen? How many messages have we sat in in church and we really thought that was the one that was going to do it? Right? How many? Probably dozens each one of us. But we didn't, we didn't start. Hear a gun. If you have a gun, go to the range and shoot a gun. You never know what it might take. The starting gun might be a starting gun. But I don't want anybody to say that Ski didn't tell you to get started. <clears throat> I want you to have that moment. And if I have to scream it, and if I have to annoy you, and if I have to convict you and offend you to get the gun to go off, I'm going to do whatever it's required. And you can hate me in your victorious life, and I'm good. Amen? Amen. Amen. The challenge we have with Jesus, how many people find Jesus a challenge? Come on, we're human. See, Jesus is a disruptor, isn't he? He just comes in and wrecks your life. Honest? Right? Right? You know? Jesus came as a disruptor. He just got in and he wrecked normal life. And he's still wrecking normal lives today. Because he wants to give abundant life. And he wants to disrupt your normal life. You know, he came as a disruptor, he will always be a disruptor. That's his nature. Because he hates what this realm has become. He will disrupt your life, and he will be inconvenient. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Following Jesus Christ is disruptive to the life your flesh and the world wants you to live in. And it's inconvenient. You're here Sunday night. This place should be packed. Some of our people aren't here. You know why? Because Jesus is inconvenient. <laughs> the sad state is we should not be laughing at that. I'm not saying that to offend your brother. <clears throat> Jesus has become inconvenient to people. The Son of God that came from glory. That gave his deity up to come down and be with us. That we nailed him to a cross. 
And he died one of the most brutal deaths in history. And he's an inconvenience to most Christians. <laughs> Think how sad that is. Pathetic. How sick that is. Pathetic. I like the word pathetic. You know, I was thinking of giving this message New Year's Eve. The sad reality is uh, it would have been too late. Because there are a lot of people out there that are inconvenienced on New Year's Eve. I told you it's going to be an offensive message. You know, it was an offensive message to me one day for a long time. But Jesus wants to come in and disrupt your plans and your parties and the things you put before him. And we don't like it. But we want to serve Jesus, but we don't want him to inconvenience our life. Right? Amen. That's the state of the majority of Christians in the world. They want what Jesus has, but they don't want to be inconvenienced with the life that Jesus requires. And so, an inconvenient Jesus that isn't followed is no Jesus at all. I want you to understand the reality of that. If you don't allow Jesus to disrupt your life, you can't follow him. Drop everything. Give up everything and follow me. Otherwise, you can't see the kingdom of God. We don't take these things seriously. We think that we can go about and do our life and we can, we can just do what we want. And, uh, you know, church is an option. Bible study is an option. And you wonder why you have no victory and why, why just life is cash crashing down all around you, which it's all around us too, by the way. But you're, you're emotionally a wreck. And you have no joy and you have no peace. And don't think your life is any worse than anyone that's a strong Christian, because it's not. It's just we have a resource because we stay close to Jesus Christ. And so we can have joy when there's chaos. We can have peace when everything around us is falling apart. And that's what faith in Christ is all about, but it takes being in convenience. Because Jesus keeps getting in the way. Doesn't he? Amen. And, you know, every Sunday? Every Sunday? Really? Every Sunday. You know, our life gets disrupted. We're supposed to come together. We're supposed to put him first. We're supposed to worship. We're supposed to, you know, uh, celebrate him. Every Sunday? I get life. I got a life to live. I got things to do, people to see, ball games to watch. <laughs> guilty? I'll never throw things out that I'm not guilty of or haven't been guilty of. But I know what it has gained when I decided to put those things behind me. See, by not letting God disrupt your life, you disqualify yourself from joy unspeakable. You disqualify yourself from peace that passes all understanding. Because Jesus is inconvenient. And we have this, uh, this thing about being disruptive. We want to have control over our life. We don't want to be telling us what to do, who to hang with, where to go. But Jesus came and you know, you know he totally wrecked Mary and Joseph's life. They're just a young couple that wants to get married. You want your life disrupted? Women, find yourself pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And tell that to the world. And your fiancé. I pray none of you have your life disrupted to that degree. Jesus disrupted Peter's life. John's life, successful businessman. Thank you. And Saul, boy, did he disrupt Saul's life. Guy was the most powerful guy in all of Judaism. Jesus wrecked his world. He ended up, oh, what a wretched man I am. 
Think Jesus disrupted that life a little bit? Yet he was the most joy-filled man when you read, read Philippians. There's something about being a wretch for Christ and being filled with joy. It's a strange thing that happens. But we all would like Jesus and we all would like God to say, you know, I'll tell you what. Yeah, bro, let's, let's go for a walk. You know, when you need me, just call, I'll be around. You know, just, you know, and if, if you got something you'd really like me to help you with, just let me know, you know, I'll just, I'll come running. And, and you know, whatever plans you got, I mean, I want nothing better than to make your plans happen and work. Wouldn't we like that guy? I don't know about your lives, that's not exactly the guy that I find. Because his plans have very rarely been my plans. But we wonder why God doesn't work when we have our plans. Even if we think that he likes our plans but hasn't called us to those plans. Sometimes there's plans that we think make sense, but we haven't actually been asked or told by God or led by Jesus to do that. Because not everyone is called to do everything. And sometimes our flesh wants to do something we're not called to. But God will be there, right? Eh? and everything falls apart. You know, this, this inconvenience, and I just wanted to bring this up uh, because I want to annoy you and offend everyone tonight. I'm going to be an equal opportunity. Now, we had a Christmas Eve service. And, and you know that we're not going to have a huge turnout uh, for a, a Christmas Eve service because it's really inconvenient to worship Jesus on Christmas Eve. I don't know if you know that. But the sad thing is we have visitors. We have visitors that come Christmas Eve because the church is too inconvenient to have a service on Christmas Eve. See, that's a sad thing to me because the leaders are the ones that are creating convenient faith that isn't faith at all. You know? And I got a lot of traditions and I got a lot of things that I used to do. Christmas Eve was a big deal in my house. Still is a big deal in my house when I get back in church. You know, it's, uh, it's just too inconvenient to be at church at those times, don't you think? As Jesus hangs on the cross with nails in his hands and his feet. Ouch. Is this real? Is Jesus real? Is he? Did he really get nailed to a, a cross? We forget the reality of it. We forget the impact of it. We forget the God of creation who did that for you. Who did that for me. And it's too inconvenient to to be in a place that Jesus would like us to be there to celebrate him because we got parties. Even a Sunday night service. You know how challenging it is for a Sunday night service? You know? I like Sunday night because we tend to get people that really don't mind being inconvenienced with Jesus. You know how many people over the years have, have said, why don't you change your Bible study from Friday night to Tuesday, Thursday? This is a lot to do on Friday night. Uh, <laughs> Amen? This whole thing started at my kitchen table with a Friday night Bible study. You know why? Because Jesus don't want you in the world on Friday night. Jesus wants you with him on Friday night. He wants to take you out of the world when it's most inconvenient for you to be out of the world. When all your friends, I said, Bible study? You see who's playing? You see who's playing over at the Paramount? Now I got tickets to the Beacon, Manhattan, Friday night. Bible study. Pink Floyd. 
I've been there. I'm not going to throw stuff on you that I haven't wrestled with and lost most of my life. But there's a life that you haven't, haven't realized. And it takes being inconvenienced. You know, Jesus says, if you want to live where I live and know what I know, you need to be where I'm going to be speaking. And sometimes that's inconvenient. You know, if you want what Jesus has, you need to be where Jesus is. Jesus is here tonight. And it's Sunday night. And yet there's football games on. And yet there's other stuff happening. But Jesus is here. And we can focus and we can praise and we can honor our King. You know, the question we have to ask ourselves is do you want to be where God is? Do you want to be where God is? Yes. Amen. That's kind of a weak answer. Amen. Do you want to be where God is? Yes. Do you want to be doing what God is doing? Yes. Then you need to be where God says we should be. Because if you're not there, you're going to miss it. And everyone in here has missed so much in your life. In 2020, I don't want you to miss it. I'm tired of the same old, same old. God's a disruptive God, and he doesn't care about your plans. I'm going to say that again. God is a disruptive God, and he could not care less about your plans. It's shocking, isn't it? God doesn't care about your plans, because your plans are all about you. God's plans are way bigger than you. And God's plans will give you purpose and joy and, 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 and stuff that you could never have with your own plans. But we don't, we don't know that, because we, we want to do what we want to do. You know, your plans are just not that important to God. He knows your plans just die with you. You know that? All the plans we do on our own, they're just going to die with us. God's plans, plan C for the future. Yes. Makes a difference for generations. Makes a difference in eternities. What are our plans? We're just a breath, you know? Another year older, one day closer to death. You know? Every breath we waste, it's something that was a gift from God. If you think that you have had an encounter with the God of creation, and your life has not been inconvenienced or disrupted, you have not had an encounter with the God of creation. Because God is a disruptor. God's plans are not your plans. He didn't come alongside you. He came so you could come alongside him. Because his plans are great. <clears throat> One of the reasons I put this message together, and it really, you know, and, and my heart is for all people. And we have several people here that are a part of our church. I'm tired of watching the same people struggle with the same things year after year. And they come in there in church, and, and they're wrestling with the same things, and they're fighting with the same things, and early conflicts, the same conflicts they had two years ago. And I'm tired of it, because you deserve more than that. And Jesus has more than that. You know, I see people come and I see people go and I see people who aren't diligent, people who are diligent coming to church. And I don't know if you all know this, but when you start to slack off on the things of God, you're not hiding it from anybody. The characteristics of someone who maybe they don't go to church as much as they used to, maybe they're hanging out with people that they used to hang out with, you're easy to read. And it's funny because people do the same things to try to hide them, you know? Some people are very real when they're following God. They're still doing things on Facebook. And it's the same kind of conversations, and sometimes they're out there, sometimes they're not. All of a sudden, they don't come to church and, they, and, and they're not really walking. Everything is scripture on Facebook. <laughs> don't worry about me. Yeah. yeah. You end up fighting with your, your loved ones. So there's something that being in church and being in Bible study and being in fellowship does that isn't about today being in church. See, being in church today is not about this. It's about what you're like the other five, six days of the week. That's where this makes the difference. 
You know, people think pastors just want you to come and want to fill up the seats. Yeah, that's nice. But that really is not what this is all about. What this is all about is for you to go out and have a victorious life. It's for you to actually attain something. Maybe from a message, maybe from just abandoning yourself to worship God. Or maybe it's fellowship and hearing somebody else's testimony and I'm going through the same thing. So that when you leave here, the other 90% of your life, Jesus is there with power. And he's there with victory. That's what coming to church every Sunday puts in you. It's not about, oh, pastor wants to see me every week. I wasn't there two weeks and I'm going to get a text. You are. <laughs> Because I love you. And I know what it was like to not go and not realize what I was missing is life was wrecking me and my family and my marriage and everything else. And say, ah, it's another message. <laughs> you know, I, I pray for all of you all the time. The people that are here visiting, I pray for you because you're not first time as I've seen you around. You know, I know, I know who you are. I'm so blessed that you see some value coming to this small little biker church. You know, and, and one thing that, that I hope you know from me, I'm going to tell you the truth, whether it beats you up and convicts you or not. But I'm just blessed that there are people that come here because they see some value in their life with Jesus Christ. And that's what this is all about. You know, I pray that the words that God gives me does something. But it's frustrating. And every pastor is frustrated. Because people sit and they put their hands up and they, you know. And the thing is, you're not allowing your life to be inconvenienced. You're in church when it's convenient. You listen to praise music when it's convenient. You don't go out and, and share with people because it's inconvenient. You, you go to get a cup of coffee and there's a guy sitting there who he might not be homeless, but he might be homeless, but he looks like he's down and out, but I got, you know, I got, I got to be somewhere. Jesus is inconvenient. When you're willing to be inconvenienced, you're going to see incredible things in your life. Because God, God's going to inconvenience you. See, that's faith. Say, okay, Lord, this is not what I want to do. But I trust that you said if I step into your will, that extraordinary things are going to happen. We need to stop the insanity. There's a scripture we read over and over again, but we don't understand the intensity of what we should think of when we hear Jeremiah the prophet. When he says, God's voice, I know the plans I have for you. It's a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and plans to give you future. That's God's plan. But we don't want our plans inconvenienced. Your plans are not going to give you anything like that. Only God's plans. And his plans will disrupt your plans. Paul tells us in the book to Ephesus, therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead. Now that could be spiritually dead as far as salvation. It could be a faith that's dead and hasn't moved and hasn't done anything. Arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of your time because the days are evil. The days are evil. When Jesus comes in and is inconvenient, it's because he wants to be inconvenient to take you out of the things that are evil. Amen. The things of the world and the things that draw you away from him. They don't have to be overtly evil, but if they draw you away from him, it is evil. I lived with that realm with baseball most of my life. You know? Oh, it's baseball. No, to me it was a sin. To me it was an idol. 
and, and Satan used it to draw me away on Sundays, because that's what my games are. How convenient. You know? You think of these things, how the world has changed, and kids' soccer leagues, do you know when most of their games are? Sunday. They're Sundays. The Satan is good at what he does. You know? Paul says, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We need to wake up. Jesus loves you more than you could ever, ever imagine. We look at the cross and it's antiseptic. We should look at the cross and understand the pain and the suffering and the bloodshed. Pull out the passion of the Christ and watch it once or twice a year. Refresh yourself with what it cost for your salvation, what it cost for your freedom. And then start to think, oh, I don't want to be inconvenienced. When you keep that fresh in your mind, what God did, you'll be surprised how all of a sudden you don't mind being inconvenienced. And your plans, you're going to leave here with plans today. How many people have plans? You got plans for tomorrow? You got plans for New Year's Eve? How much did you confer with Jesus about those plans? <coughs> we'll leave that one there. How much did you confer with Jesus? The one who has a plan for you. How much did you confer with him? You know, Proverbs in 16, Proverbs 69 says, uh, the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. God does just, not, does just not want to be cooperative with your life. God does not want to cooperate with your plans. You're flipping the relationship around. Amen? Amen? Are we okay so far? Yes. Nobody's run out yet. I think I'm doing pretty good. There may be weapons though. <laughs> Jesus comes into your life and really the, the truth of the matter is he's comes in to disrupt pretty much everything. If you want God to be convenient, you don't want God. If you want God to be convenient, you don't want God. You want something else. You want something less. You know, we spent, I'm getting near the end now, we spent four weeks, three weeks, I, I, I spoke on the names that God gave his son, this babe in a manger, and the importance of men in our lives. And we talked about the son of man and how God came down and, and Jesus was more proud of his name, the son of man, than anything else he was called because his purpose was to take on flesh and blood. And he was so joy-filled that his, that was his purpose. He loved you so much that he came down and he just took on our flesh and our blood. And he loved being called the son of man because that means he was with us in the battle. He's in the trenches. He's in the foxholes with us. And then we talked about Emmanuel, God with us. The fact that God lowered himself and he walked among us as one of us. God with us. What God does that? Our God. Amen? Amen. Yeah. No other God does that. It's our God. And then the third week, we talk about the only name that matters. The name by which one must be saved. That every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we talked about why there's power in the name of Jesus. Literal spiritual power. Not just a mind set, but the fact that the name Jesus came from the original um, statement God said to Moses saying, I am. I am becoming Yahweh, becoming Jehovah, becoming Joshua, becoming Jesus. And so when you name the name of Jesus, you're saying, I am has empowered me. The God of all creation. But do you walk in it? Are you willing to be inconvenienced for it? And then last week, it wasn't last week, it was Christmas Eve, for those that were here, the signs. God has given each of you so many signs every day your whole life. Yeah. He has spoken to you through people. Yeah. He's spoken to you through situations. Yes. He's spoken to you through his word. He's spoken to you through so many different things. And either you don't believe it, you miss it, you're not looking for it. God has us all the time. We have the most powerful thing in the universe. 
and we are, are we, we don't want to be inconvenienced. Listen to, listen to yourself. Next time, you know, this being with God. And yes, is church important? Never forget Jesus died for the church. It's not about the ceiling and the walls. It's about the fellowship and the people. Jesus died for the church. It says it over and over again. He died so we could have a church, we could be the church, and the church could change the world. James chapter 4 it says, Do you not know what your life will be like tomorrow? You're just a vapor. It appears for a while, then it's gone. Proverbs says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. That's really another way of saying he has a plan. So he has a path. Well, that path is a plan. Do we trust his plan? And Philippians. And this is... I get one more scripture. I want you to understand this truth that Paul says to the church in Philippi. As he's in manacles, he thinks he's on death row, he's in jail, and he thinks he's going to die. And he's in the most joy he's ever been in his life. It's the most joy-filled book of the Bible. And he says, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. God started a good work in you the day you got saved. And you've been too inconvenienced to let him continue to do the work. And you're missing. You're missing the joy and the peace and the purpose. And you're accepting meager crap that the world's giving you. A better job, a little party, some friends that like to laugh about stupid things. <laughs> And I want to close it with, with my inconvenience. When I was growing up all my, all my life, Christmas Eve was the big deal. My mother would make, she wasn't Italian, but she might have been like Italian. We didn't have seven fishes because we had to have room for all the other stuff too. If we were, if we were Italian, we probably would have had the seven fishes. Christmas Eve was a big deal. And then I got saved and then we, we have a ministry, and I had this, this crew of buying us a Christ. And Christmas Eve, we would go to my house, and we'd ride to Shirley Assembly of God for Christmas Eve service. And Pastor Rayner would preach the longest darn message you ever heard in your life, <laughs> while food is on the table. But we went, and it was inconvenient. This is the fruit. You don't know what God wants to do with you if you let him inconvenience you. This is, this is ridiculous compared to what, we never thought anything like this. Keith was with us in those days. We're just a ragtag bunch of guys trying to ride and get some bikers to notice Jesus. Well, we went Christmas Eve, longest messages. <laughs> An hour goes by and it's like, <laughs> see he was my pastor so it didn't bother me as much as everyone else, you know, coming out of the, the 20 minute Baptist messages, you know, and uh, going to church every Sunday <clears throat> was an option. I felt it was a suggestion by God. Allow God to inconvenience you. The moment, I'll be done in like one minute if you want to cue the, the, the song. There's a moment that I think embodies what I pray each one of you can experience. In the movie or the book, A Christmas Carol, you all know, right? Scrooge? He has the three ghosts that come. And 
And then he wakes up. And all he can think of, have I missed it? Have I missed it? Some of you have gone your whole life missing it. You don't even know what you missed. If you can grasp this and allow God to speak to you and step into what God wants to make with your life. And yes, be inconvenienced in some of the stuff. The joy on Ebenezer Scrooge's face when he realized, I haven't missed it, is what you're missing. And that's my prayer. I hope some of you, this is the most important message that you have for the year 2020. Because it only takes one message to change everything. Amen. But it takes a decision. And that's what this is all about. Decisions. Thus says the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, who formed it and established it. The Lord is his name. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. That's my prayer for 2020, for all of you. In uh, four hours, I forgot how to add all of a sudden. <laughs> and a lot less time than I said before. It's going to be a new year. Let God do a new thing. Don't let next year you, you're sitting in the same place asking for the same stuff. Jesus is too important. Jesus didn't mind being inconvenienced in a way we never would have imagined. But God wants to do a new thing. And uh, in the words of Isaiah, will you even be aware of it? Some of you will. But the sad part is some of you will go home. And three days from now, this will be another dusty message left on the floor of the church. Let it not be you. We're going to get together in two days. And we're going to have a time of fellowship. Nine o'clock Tuesday. We're going to have a service at 1030. And then at midnight, we bring in the new year the only way, and the only worthy way to bring in the new year, and that's with community, as a family of God. You're all welcome to join us. Um, some of you have your own plans, have your own churches. <coughs> Just make a decision sometime to allow God to inconvenience you and watch what God will do. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. We've got a song, and then we'll close and go home. Amen. Father, Lord, I, I, I think all of us at some point in our life look at ourselves with shame. Lord, as we, we gaze on the cross, we close our eyes and we picture your son looking into our eyes, doing that for me. Lord, I for one am ashamed of my lack of diligence. There isn't enough effort in me to honor that sacrifice. All I can do is all I can do, and I'm blessed that's all you require. And Lord, I pray that each one here, they, they make a commitment to you, knowing that your promises say an inconvenience is victory. Lord, that we have a dichotomy of faith where the more we're inconvenienced and suffer, the more joy and purpose and peace we have. And it's an interesting dichotomy of faith that most people are afraid to veer into because they don't want to be inconvenienced, face suffering, pain, trials. 
But that's where the risk is to attain joy and peace and abundant life. Let us be risk takers. 2020, a year of a clearer vision. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Never say no one told you when to run. Tonight you've heard the starting gun. Amen? Amen. Remember, one day wasted is another day closer to death. I pray no more. No more. Jesus deserves our all. Amen? Amen. Thank you for those who have visited us. I'm honored that you've come to hear this message and to be with us today. And uh, I thank you. Father, as we, we leave here, Lord, let us see you do a new thing. Lord, but let us all be aware of it. Let us understand the new thing you're doing is us. That's our prayer as we leave here. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.